Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to start. My name is Orit Bashkin and I'm the director of, uh, for the Center of uh, Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Chicago. Um, I'd like to start uh, by thanking uh, profoundly uh, the folks who made uh, this event possible, uh, by which I mean the Assyrian Universal Alliance Foundation, the AUAF, uh, and in particular, we'd like to extend our gratitude to Dr. John Michael, Dr. Roland Michael, Dr. Edison Ishaya, Dr. Mark Merdekian, Dr. Robert De Kileta, and Dr. Uh, Abby Paul Jiddo for their uh, support, encouragement, and to thank uh, Tiglet uh, Esabe of the AUAF for his leadership. Again, we'd like to thank um, the AUAF for uh, their leadership, for their generosity, and for their patience as we try to organize uh, a lecture series during a global pandemic. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Martha Bernson from the University of Chicago and Dr. Tom McGuire. Now, um, this is a, a series of lecture about the history of the Assyrians in the modern world. And we'd like to welcome you to this lecture uh, as wearing kind of two hats. One is as Chicagoans, knowing that Chicago is a home for many members of the Assyrian community. Our second half is the head of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Chicago. Our center is dedicated to the study of the Middle East. Um, and over the years, we have held a number of lectures and events about the history of Christians uh, in uh, the Middle East, be they Armenians, Greek Orthodox, or Copts. We view these communities as uh, an integral part of the region's history and culture, and we're delighted to open um, a conversation and a lecture series about the history of the Assyrians in the modern Middle East. We're very interested in the series to explore the history of villages, churches, cities, diasporas, print cultures and publications in Iran, in Iraq, and every place else where the Assyrians um, are thriving, whether the US or uh, Europe. Uh, we hope that the series will celebrate and commemorate communities, cultures, and history um, and will inform both the members of the community in Chicago and across the world, and also our own students uh, and faculty. It is with this ideals in mind that I'm delighted to present to you our speaker, Dr. Alda Benjamin, who's a leading scholar of the modern Assyrians uh, in Iraq. Uh, she's about to publish an exciting book about this topic, um, and her studies sort of covered the history of the Assyrians from uh, in Iraq from the late 19th century until the 1980s. She has written about cultural heritage, gender, bilingualism, political organization, and her work has been appreciated and celebrated in the many institutions she worked in, including the University of Maryland, the Smithsonian, the University of Pennsylvania Museum, and uh, University of Berkeley, uh, California, where she currently works. Um, she has done uh, quite a lot in terms of publishing and public activity. I won't, uh, I won't list uh, all of her activities and many publications, but just to read you a few titles of uh, her articles and mention some of her works. Village Nostalgia, Assyrian Folklore and the Hybrid Intellectual Sphere in Modern Iraq. Assyrians in Iraq Ninve Plans, Grassroot Organization and Intercommunal Conflict. Rural Violence versus Urban Intellectualism, A Paradox of Integration and Emancipation, co-authored with Sargon Delban. She was also active in sort of bringing Assyrian studies into the fold of Middle Eastern studies, editing a special, issues about, a special issue, Narrative of Coexistence and Pluralism in Northern Iraq in the Journal of Contemporary Iraq and the Arab World. Um, and leading a roundtable, Minoritization and Pluralism in the Modern Middle East in the International Journal of Middle Eastern Studies. She's also one of the few scholars who publish on the Assyrians based on uh, documents published by the members of the community found in Iraqi archives and libraries, 
and not based on foreign sources to be found in British or Ottoman archives, which is an extremely unique and an important contribution. So again, I'd like to welcome all of you. Uh, we're delighted that you're here. We'd like to thank again all the members of the Assyrian Universal Allowance Foundation for allowing us to have this um, event and to welcome Dr. Benjamin. Thank you. Good evening and Shama Lochen. I'm very honored to be the first presenter in a lecture series focusing on the modern Assyrians. As a historian engaged in the study of this community, I'm grateful for the stewardship provided by the AUAF uh, under uh, Mr., uh, the leadership of uh, Mr. Tiglat Isabi uh, and Dr. John Michael and the enthusiasm by which they were received by Dr. Reid Bashkin and the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Chicago. Together, they have elevated Assyrian studies. I especially thank you, our esteemed guests, for tuning in for my talk and offering your support for academic endeavors relating to the study of this community and the preservation of its history. I began this research a decade and a half ago. And over the years, numerous individuals shared their private collections and memories with me in Iraqi cities, towns, and villages, but also in Chicago, Toronto, and Northern California, along with other diasporic cities. It pains me to know that many of those kind and generous people who have welcomed me in their homes, particularly in the Nineveh Plains and Musfil, have become homeless today. May they be sustained by the rich and valuable lives they have had and find peace and comfort in their future. I'm profoundly thankful to them and you all. I will go ahead and share my PowerPoint presentation with you now. Okay. <clears throat> So the outline for my talk, you know, I will introduce uh, the topic, uh, I will discuss my sources and approaches, and then focus on the research talk. My presentation is derived from a chapter, a segment of a chapter, really, in my forthcoming book that I now am finalizing at the University of California, Berkeley, as the Abi Malik Bediusa Fellow in Assyrian History. The book is titled Assyrians in Modern Iraq, Negotiating Political and Cultural Space, and covers the years 1960 to 1988. During this time, Assyrians began migrating um, from their historical towns and villages in the northern region to urban centers, moving to larger Iraqi cities and towns in search of modern professions and employment primarily in the expanding oil industry, but also for better educational opportunities. Within these urban spaces, Assyrians became attracted to intellectual and polit political movements that allowed them to emerge from the peripheries of their society, temporarily discarding their minoritized status to engage with other Iraqis of their socioeconomic background. Within these secular and often leftist political spaces, Assyrians found room to maneuver and form strategic alliances, both as individuals and as a community, in order to advance issues that were often beneficial to the community as a whole. The Assyrians discussed in my book were generally active within political opposition parties. But especially in the early 1970s, they also found room to negotiate with the Iraqi state using historical narratives that were accepted by the Ba'athist regime, which allowed Assyrians agency in pursuing issues that were important to them. The creative employment of popular culture, and in particular, the use of modern technology to produce and disseminate music, enabled Assyrians to celebrate their culture, engage in transnational interactions with Assyrians outside Iraq, encounter the official narratives more assertively than was possible in the press. The Ba'ath had just succeeded in consolidating its political power in Iraq following two coup d'etats in 1979 
in July 1968. Wanting to increase its physical and ideological hegemony and wary of its political opponents, the Iraqi Communist Party and the Kurdish Democratic Party, it made various short-lived concessions, including favorable policies for members of minority communities. Assyrians found themselves, found themselves clashing with the state, yet also motivated to collaborate with it. Given the expansion of the state's resources and influence relating to oil, the Assyrians were not a direct threat to the Ba'ath Party since they lacked autonomous political representation during this period. Their political influence was realized through their membership in the Iraqi opposition. The Assyrians were significant not only for their role within the opposition to the Ba'athist regime, but also for the transnational character they conferred upon it. During the Cold War, they employed transnational networks that benefited the community and, and the political entities affiliated with it. Lobbying Western governments and human rights organization through Assyrians living in the West. The state abandoned conciliatory efforts towards Assyrians and oppositional groups and employed various levels of state repression during periods of violence or when it was strong economically and, its, and in its foreign relations. During these periods, the hierarchy of citizenship that ranked Iraqi society according to ethnic, religious, socioeconomic, gender, political, geographical, and other criteria was enforced more openly. State policies towards the Assyrians were not always applied consistently between rural and urban Assyrian communities or between Assyrians opposing the state or veering from accepted state narratives and those supportive of the state. The Ba'athist state policies towards the Assyrians were often reflective of internal and external pressures the state was confronted with. The role of Assyrians within the oppositional parties necessitated the state's attempt to attract Assyrian political, religious, and intellectual leaders into cooperative arrangements with incentives such as the promulgation of law in 1972 that promised cultural and social rights. So, so we talked about the Iraqi opposition. Uh, this is just a map to show you where the Assyrians are situated. So, so these dots that you have here, many minorities live here, and you see um, the proximity to Iran. Iran was funding the opposition, uh, and Assyrians within Iran also had some influence on the monarchical regime in Iran uh, and, and also helped some Assyrian organizations uh, in that regard. And just to give you some statistics, I, I include charts in, in the forthcoming book, but um, you know, you might ask what significance did the Assyrians have uh, as, a, as a minority community? Well, if you look into the 1957 census, which is the best, more accurate, most accurate census that we have uh, for the country, um, you know, in Mosul, which at the time included the province of Dahok, they, they had not been separated yet. Um, you know, the, the percentages of the Assyrians, if you look into particular districts, for example, Amidiya, about 24%, uh, Dahok, about 14%, uh, Zaho, about 21, 22%. And, and, you know, these numbers are significant. Um, of course, the Assyrians will tell you that our numbers were much higher, uh, and the Turkmens officially complained about the 1957 census, uh, but these are the best numbers we have. And, and still, I mean, within 20%, 17%, they, they can become uh, quite significant for the opposition. So uh, Law 251 that was issued in 1972, as I stated, um, with the help of this law, Important literary works were produced not only in Arabic, which contributed to cross-cultural hybridization between Iraqis of various backgrounds, but also in modern uh, Aramaic or Assyrian, the native language of the Assyrians. The production of works in modern Aramaic, which with the modest support of the government, contributed to the revival and standard standardization of the language across the various Eastern Aramaic dialects spoken in Iraq, as well as Iran, Syria, and the growing diaspora. Numerous important works were produced during this short period, and the formation of significant cultural clubs and organizations provided important cultural venues for Assyrians to interact and socialize, to perform plays, music, and literary works. 
and to engage in sports. An important intellectual class from, was formed in cities like Baghdad, Kirkuk, and Mosul, to which large Assyrian populations that had migrated in search of better employment and educational opportunities, or to escape the instability and violence experienced in their villages, resulting primarily from the Kurdish uprising that had begun in 1961 and the, and the, and the uh, civil war with the government. Okay, so, so just um, a note about Law 251, which is important to notice, and, and this changes later on in the decade, and particularly in the 1980s, but it's interesting to see how this is a preface for Law 251, how uh, the community or, you know, is referred to as Al-Qawmiyat um, Al-Qawmiyya, uh, or the national minorities. Uh, by the end of the 70s, then beginning of the 80s, um, the, the terminology used uh, to refer to the community would be denomination. It would be a, a Christian denomination. Um, and I'll leave this up for a bit. Let me move on. So the cultural rights guaranteed, there, there was a list of laws, but of course, cultural and literary rights, uh, and also the important, um, re the return of important leaders um, to the community, religious and political. Okay, I want to briefly mention some of my sources and approaches um, to the study of, of uh, Assyrians. Due to a general over-reliance on British colonial sources, Assyrians in Iraq are frequently portrayed as mere agents of an imperial power. To present a more balanced and nuanced perspective that incorporates Assyrian um, voices, uh, but also including women and gender issues, I have woven together conventional and unconventional archival sources, as well as ethnographic data, uh, such as music, art, and poetry. I traveled to Iraq several times to conduct research at the Iraqi National Library and Archives in Baghdad, as well as in smaller libraries and publishing houses in and around Musul, Erbil, and Duhok. The secular and relig religious textual material found in these libraries helped to balance the study. I complemented archival research uh, sources with Arabic and, and uh, modern Aramaic language Assyrian periodicals. So at the archives, you know, some of the sources that I use are police records and the bilingual press that I mentioned, uh, which I will be focusing on for, for this presentation is Murdan al Turaya or the literate Assyrian, Al Mutaqaf al Athuri. And, uh, and a note about this uh, important um, magazine there was about um, 2,000 copies printed of, of it, circulated distributed throughout Iraq and 500 additional copies of it were sent to the diasporas. Um, the, the printing was regulated by the government, so they could have printed more, but they, they were not able to. Um, and a new issue appeared every two to three months. And it was uh, uh, published by the Assyrian Culture Club as well. A focus on Iraq's um, linguistic diversity enabled me to introduce hither though unknown Iraqi Assyrian intellectuals. In addition to archival documents, I included music and poetry. The significance of popular culture as a medium of intellectual and cultural production is that it includes voices beyond those found in traditional sources, which at times exclude Assyrians. Also, oral interviews provided a perspective that I felt was missing in print sources and archival documents. This approach is particularly important when examining rural movements. In my work, I question top down and structural approaches that have been wrongly deployed to study Christian communities in particular uh, and including the Assyrians. These communities have been considered exclusively through the lens of religion, ignoring both their minoritization on the basis of language, cultural practices, and ethnicity, and also their more pluralistic engagements within secular spaces. My work challenges the monolithic perspectives of majorities that leave out the history of minorities, perspectives that have traditionally been reinforced by an over-reliance on colonial and mainly Western sources and approaches that have been used to study minority communities. In adopting this approach, my work moves away beyond city centers, 
and explores the peripheries where communities like the Assyrians mostly lived. Although this talk focuses on urban Assyrians and Baghdadi ones at that. Such approaches allow us to challenge notions, uh, to challenge notion that minority communities are static or unchanging, enabling us to employ intersectionality as an analytical tool relating to categories such as gender, race, and socioeconomic status. Okay, so coming to my uh, research talk, where I'll be talking about how these um, Assyrian intellectuals um, in Baghdad, mainly in the 1970s, um, resisted and negotiated with the state and, and how that looked, out, looked like in their press. During the 1970s, Assyrian intellectuals promoted their culture and negotiated with the government for political rights, often framing their concerns in terms of accepted Ba'athist narratives. Negotiation was a process in which Assyrians tried to understand themselves as a community and reach internal consensus, both within their ecclesiastical communities and between tribal, religious, and secular leaders. The community positioned itself with an Iraqi society in relation to both the state and the opposition, and transnationally with the Assyrian diaspora and human rights organizations. Eric Davis argues that savvy non-elite or subaltern groups like the Assyrians began to subscribe to historical narratives propagated by the state so to avoid provoking state authorities by expressing unauthorized ones. But memories propagated by the state were also challenged. The Assyrians, among other Iraqi communities, used counter memory in their textual and oral productions to challenge the state's interpretation of their past. Assyrians were often successful in subverting the state's narrative by incorporating multiple meanings, multiple layers of meaning into their texts, challenging a particular position propagated by the state. In the first half of the 1970s, Assyrians negotiated for rights within the Ba'athist system, constructing historical narratives that had integrated themselves into the social fabric of Iraqi society since Abbasid times. During this period, Assyrian intellectuals celebrated these policies, but probed the system by pushing its boundaries, while nevertheless maintaining their, their support for Ba'athism, at times superficially and incorporating Ba'athist principles to justify cultural and political rights for their community. The regime for its part temporarily pursued reconciliation through policies that drew the community closer to it and worked on implementing laws that projected it favorably in the West. At the same time, these approaches um, enabled it to penetrate Assyrian institutions. So when I talked about some uh, leaders being uh, welcomed back to the state, and I'll discuss them in the talk, here's an image, um, a parade for Marshall Moon uh, in 1970. Uh, he was exiled since the 1930s, the Semel massacre uh, during that time, along with other intellectuals and political leaders. Uh, and here he is, he's a right, um, if you can see him clearly. Um, uh, and it was reported about 100,000 Assyrians welcomed him uh, in Baghdad. And to the right, we have um, a publication, Baghdad Observer, um, with the title, uh, An Injustice Corrected. Of course, we don't know exactly what this injustice that they're subtly referring to is, uh, but the Assyrians um, thought of it as being Semel, the Semel massacre, negotiating Semel. The memory of Semel was expressed with subtlety in written sources as we shall see, but Assyrians commemorated the event more openly in their songs. So the Semel massacre um, is um, a massacre that um, the Iraqi, the, the newly formed Iraqi uh, army in 1933 attacks the village of Semel where about 600 or so people are killed there. And, and you know, the attacks carried out by others, including um, tribes, Arab and Kurdish tribes, um, throughout the region um, last a few weeks or so, uh, where the numbers vary from 3,000 to 6,000 people killed. Uh, so it's a very important memory that the Assyrian community commemorates um, every year um, on August 7th. 
particularly Assyrians um, in Iraq uh, and, and uh, those in Iran as well and some of the diaspora. So the August 7th commemoration has come for Iraqi and Assyrians um, and Iranian Assyrians to also include those killed in the in the uh, the genocide 1915 genocide period. So it, it's a day that uh, all the martyrs or Sahadeh, it's called Yom Sahadeh, the day of the martyrs are commemorated and remembered uh, on the day of the Semel massacre. So this, the memory of Semel was expressed with subtlety in written sources, as we shall see, but Assyrians commemorated the event more openly in their songs. Music had always been an important vessel of oral history for ethnic minorities in the Middle East whose language, cultural rights, and ethnic identity have been suppressed by their circumstances. Music and singing have become major means of resisting the status quo, providing a means of curating social memory by disseminating a community's own understanding of its history. When native speakers of a language were not allowed to learn it in a school setting or standardize it formally, only a small percentage of them were able to read it. These few constituted a reading public, as opposed to those who did not read it, who constituted a listening public. Since the listening public did not need advanced reading and writing skills, in their native tongue to be able to compose or listen to music, music became the medium through which the culture was revived and the community's identity and social memory reinforced. With the flow of music across borders, its influence extended beyond the zone of its creation. The Assyrian Culture Club was a prominent hub for the development of Assyrian literature and popular culture, giving voice to its national aspirations. Numerous singers were drawn to this club in Baghdad and began their singing careers performing at one of its functions. Shreeman Butchmuel, for example, was a recent um, high school graduate and active member of the club when he lifted the veil from the Semel massacre by presenting a song entitled Semel in August 1973. This is one year after the cultural rights were issued to the Assyrians. On the third anniversary of the opening of the club in Baghdad, the song captured the community's social memory of the Semel massacre committed by the Iraqi army in August 1933 against the Assyrians. Given that two Assyrian leaders associated with the Semel massacre, Marishai Shamwan and Malik Yaqo Smail, who was uh, a tribal leader, also exiled um, in, following Semel, had both recently been welcomed back by the Iraqi government, treated initially as honored official guests Assyrians felt the need to engage publicly with the contentious memory of the massacre. The song was ultimately a product of the space that had been opened up by the improved relations between the state and the Assyrian community. The song begins with background sound of chaos and the screams of people apparently anticipating the massacre, wondering what to do. Shall we stay or escape? Is this not our country? They ask. This foreshadows what is to come. The word massacre is repeated 11 times throughout the song. The lyrics include symbolism associated with brutality, chaos, death, and survival. Children are crying on the bodies of their dead mothers. Silent corpses, plains and mountains have turned crimson with the blood. The clear description given by the singer reflecting the social memory of the community is that a massacre of innocent children and women had taken place, not the killing of rebellious armed men. This would have contradicted government accounts from the 1930s, which represented the massacre as a suppression of a militia challenging the sovereignty of the Iraqi state. Whereas the subject of Semel was mentioned indirectly in Murdana Aturaya as the raging hurricane of the 1930s. In this song, the community's perspective was given prominence and the singer did not shy away from calling it a massacre. Shreem and Bichmuel suffered repercussions for performing the song at the Assyrian Culture Club in 1973. After being harassed by the Iraqi authorities, he was led to seek refuge in Iran, according to his biography. It was there that his career as a, mu as a musician flourished. He enrolled at the University of Tehran to study music and English literature 
and produced records with the support of the Iranian Assyrian community, chiefly the Assyrian Council of Tehran. His first record was released at the Assyrian New Year on April 1st, 1974, and featured his now infamous song, Semel. It is highly likely that his records simultaneously became available in Iraq with relative ease, given that the civil war was still going on and that Iran was funding the Iraqi opposition. Shmuel was physically removed from Iraq, but through his music, his voice was effectively amplified and conveyed back to his community in Iraq. The Assyrian Culture Club, excuse me. <clears throat> so to conclude the Semel section, in the early 1970s, the Assyrians were aided in remembering the Semel massacre when religious and political figures who had experienced it had been and had been exiled by the Iraqi state in 1933 were invited back as official state dignitaries. But the state failed to address the memory of the Semel massacre and the events that had led to their exile. The Assyrians found the omissions of these facts problematic and called for the resurrection of their memory. In the absence of an official government narrative of the massacre, the Assyrians were cautiously transgressive, referring to Semel only subtly in print. In this asymmetrical contact zone, subordinate groups resisted the control of their memory through silence or else confronted it in covert and subtle ways. Language, and in particular, the print and popular culture to which it had given rise provided a medium in which issues could be addressed that were ignored or suppressed by the state. The space opened up by the government's granting of cultural rights allowed Assyrians to discuss many of these unresolved issues once again, including identity. What were the characteristics that defined their collective community? What historical narratives could they agree upon? Should they identify as Assyrians? If so, how should they deal with the various religious and linguistic des designations? Assyrian secular intellectuals associated with Murdana Turaya, as well as other publications, engage with these questions on the pages of the magazine. They share the shared heritage of a Syriac Christian past, revered Syriac martyrs and saints, a common language and cultural traditions all undoubtedly tied the various Assyrian religious communities together. The Ba'ath government accepted discourses concerning all of those factors, but official state narratives were less willing to tolerate communities, the, the community's association with an ancient Assyrian past. Assyrian intellectuals in urban centers like Baghdad realized this, and though unwilling, to accept Arab national narratives or to Arabize their community, they integrated themselves during formative historical periods of an Arab nationalism that was being celebrated by the Ba'athists, namely Abbasidism, which I still, which I will discuss next. The Iraqi government supplemented legislative policies with financial assistance to Assyrian cultural organizations. Government agencies also engage the community by facilitating international academic conferences featuring classical Syriac intellectuals and invited Western scholars to participate. In February, 1973, a festival was organized to honor St. Ephraim, a fourth century hymnographer and theologian of the school of Nisibis and Hunayn bin Ishaq who died in the ninth century, physician and translator who was active in the House of Wisdom in Abbasid, um, Baghdad. The men were described by the magazine as prominent intellectuals in the fields of translation, composition, and service to humanity. This event was held by the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Inquiry under the supervision and organization of uh, the Assembly of the Syriac Language. The author of the article characterizes conference as an embodiment of the cultural rights 
granted by the government, but granted by the Revolutionary Council, the latter had dedicated over 10,000 dinars, the equivalent of 30,000 US dollars, to cover the expenses of the festival, which was significant, which was a significant first step in demonstrating to the community the practical outcomes of its policies. The author in this article published in Murdana Turaya briefly described the significance of these two historical figures and paving the way for the emer emergence and the advancement of an intellectual renaissance. This renaissance had contributed to the emanation of Islamic civilization, which in turn had influenced world civilization. Here, the author departed from his, this general historical view on the background of St. Ephraim and Hunayn bin Ishaq, contextualizing these historical figures in contemporary affairs. And as you see in, in this um, quote, that I have projected some of the terminology he uses. The author used modern political terminology that defined the relations between uh, state and society, citizenship and national rights, for instance, to construct a narrative of inclusion and plurality between the Assyrian community and the ruling authority from medieval to modern times. He indirectly equated the current Ba'athist administration with the rightly guided caliphs of the golden age of Islam. During this time, the Ba'ath the Ba'ath regime was itself propagating a historical memory that fused Mesopotamianism with Iraq's Abbasid Islamic heritage, at the same time demonstrating support for pan-Arabism. The author embedded the Assyrians within a historical narrative that catered to Arab nationalism with an emphasis on the Abbasid past. Within this discourse, the author highlighted the intellectual contributions of Assyrians to Islam and humanity, framing Assyrians as an integral native component of the country deserving a full national rights as citizens. The international conference focusing on St. Ephraim and Hunayn deployed accepted narratives in exemplifying what was permissible according to law 251. The amount of money spent on the conference was significant even by today's standards and reflected the scale of the cultural project the government was engaged in. This investment was potentially beneficial to the state in two ways. First, the conference attracted important Western scholars, interviews with whom appeared in Murdana Aturaya. This was important because the opposition, which included the Assyrians, was actively seeking international support in its campaign against the Iraqi state. The presence of Western scholars and publicity could assist the newly formed Ba'ath state in portraying itself in a positive light, especially given the conference's emphasis on Christian minorities. Secondly, the, the government was actively seeking the support and indeed pursuing cooperation of the Assyrian community, including examples, for instance, of the, the formation of a Christian militia, promises of an autonomous region and such. This conference sought to demonstrate to the community that the regime was willing to implement Law 251, promoting Syriac language and culture. Beyond negotiating subtle and defined forms of resistance. In negotiating for their rights, Assyrians did not confine themselves to accepted narratives. They also showed this content by resisting subtly in the press, but more defiantly in other media, as, was, as we saw in the case of the Samael song. For instance, following the conference honoring Hunayn bin Ishaq and St. Ephraim, a number of intellectuals associated with Murdana Turaya showed their dissatisfaction with the way the conference had been organized. In the same issue of the magazine that praised the conference and featured interviews with Western scholars, a one-page article appeared anonymously attributed to the editorial and press committee, offering constructive criticism. After showering praises on the event and its organizers, once again, the authors listed six points they, had, they took issue with. First, the president of the assembly of the Syriac language had forgotten to mention Assyrians in his opening speech for the conference. They, remind, they reminded him that Assyrians had been at the forefront of those who cherished St. Ephraim's poetry and religious homilies. 
and had used them continually from the times of St. Ephraim until, until the present. Second, the authors recommended that the master of ceremonies use modern Aramaic alongside Arabic, since the assembly of the Syriac language had been established to revive the language. And most of the audience members were from the community. The third point related to organization and the fourth and fifth point were related to the absence of lectures in the Aramaic language of St. Ephraim and the absence of translations of any of the lectures into Aramaic, though many lectures appeared in Arabic and in Western languages. The magazine's criticism were provocative in raising numerous concerns about an event organized and promoted internationally by the government. This was one of the few instances in which dissatisfaction towards the government authorities by the Assyrian intellectuals associated with the Assyrian Cultural Club in Baghdad was exhibited in their magazine. The fact that no single author's name was associated with this article indicated that they either feared repercussions from the authorities or did not know what to expect. But the act of publishing this article proves in itself that, at least temporarily, a complicated space existed that was marked by asymmetrical power relations, enabling intellectuals to negotiate and resist the official state narrative. The article also invited readers to engage critically with, with the unauthorized publications. Clearly, there was disgruntlement among Assyrian intellectuals who were not completely convinced by the regime's outwardly positive policies concerning the Assyrian community. Their position was also highlighted in the magazine's interview with Yaqo. For instance, Yaqo was asked about his impression of the terminology used in Law 251, which referred to the Assyrians as the speakers of the Syriac language. Yaqo crit criticized the use of a language to depict a nation, quoting, the designation in its actuality as it has been received is incorrect because whoever coined it depended on the element of a language on its own without contemplating the spirit of nationality. He was puzzled by the designation having never heard people or shaft referred to as the speakers of the al Fulaniya, a certain language. Continuing, although we might be divided denominationally, you will find us united nationally, Omiyan, on being Assyrian. And of course, Assyrians, there are rural Assyrians, you know, there's, it, it, it's a different, um, you know, there's occasional political opposition that's still going on. Uh, in 1972, the Higher Committee for Christian Affairs, is, it's formed with 3,000 to 10,000 registered um, men joining this militia against the Iraqi um, government with the Iraqi, with the opposition. Um, and, and you have competition, both from the Iraqi government and the Iraqi opposition uh, for the Assyrian community. As early as the mid 1970s, the Assyrians were beginning to see the reversal of Ba'athist policies. This turnaround coincided with the subsidizing of political opponents of the Ba'ath regime following the Algiers agreement between Iran and Iraq, which settled border disputes and had Iran stop funding the Iraqi opposition. By the end of the 1970s, changes were being detected in the magazine as well. So the aftermath of the Algiers Agreement, um, you have a reversal of Assyrian uh, of government policies towards them, towards a community, and the bathification of society during the Iran-Iraq War, which, which follows between 1980-1988. The most obvious changes were visual. The cover pages of the first um, 14 issues featuring photographs of ancient Mesopotamian imagery integrated with modern Assyrian cultural images reflecting the community's understanding of itself. Okay. In the first issue, for example, an image of cuneiform script served as a background of the cover image. Above the cuneiform script, the acronym 
of the Assyrian Cultural Qu Center was displayed in Aramaic, Sheen Mim Alab. The bottom here. The Assyrian star adorned the center of the image. The second issue featured Mesopotamian men engaged in a discussion. On the right-hand panel of the cover, a photograph of Malik Yaqo Ismail was displayed, whom I, I referred to already. The cover image of the third and fourth issue showed what appeared to be images of ancient Nineveh with the subheading, Nineveh between old and new. The first photograph showed the ancient city in ruins. The second depicted a construction site in Nineveh with a crane and a man rebuilding the city. And the third showed the rebuilt ancient city. A few cover images did not display ancient Mesopotamian imagery, but still related to the content of the magazine and its overall theme, cultural and linguistic progress and revival, and more subtly, national and political rights. For instance, issues nine and 10, 1976, bore cover images of athletic men exercising their bodies shaped into the 22 letters of the Assyrian Aramaic alphabet. Again, progress was combined with modernity, youth, and the language revival. Starting with issue five, 1978, so this is a few years after the Algiers Agreement and, and uh, where the opposition became less significant, the cover images became less Assyrian specific, reducing references to the ancient past and to the cultural heritage and including more general and religious imagery. This change was a response to government restrictions against explicit associations with the ancient past in issue 15, a melancholic painting appeared featuring two sorrowful faces fallen on the ground. Issue 16 in 1978 bore an image of a young Assyrian girl, young Assyrian girls dressed as brides for the cultural and religious celebration of Kalusulaka, commemorated during the Feast of Ascension. Issues 7, 17 and 18 in 1978 and 19 and 20 in 1979. Um, and 21 and 27, 79 to 81, featured a female villager standing in a field, a photograph of a child, and the monastery of St. Hermas, which I don't have here. The, th the next three issues from 1981 to 1984 exclusively focus on Saddam Hussein and war-related imagery. So you, sh you see the progression. And at this time, of course, the Iran-Iraq war had started 19, 1980 to 1988. These visual, these visual changes reflected changes in the content of the magazine as well. The tone of the articles altered, featuring less negotiation and subtle challenges to the official government line were more limited. In the Aramaic more than the Arabic section, articles on culture, language, and Mesopotamian heritage were still featured. And some articles and poetry could be taken to have double meanings. But the formally dynamic and interactive nature of the magazine, which had confronted governmental propaganda, narratives both subtly and more directly, was now absent. As a strategic influence of Assyrians within oppositional groups had evaporated, Following the Algiers Agreement of 1975, conciliatory Ba'athist policies towards them were reduced, especially following the onset with, with war with Iran. These developments had repercussions for Murdan al Turaya. Uh, in fact, all established Assyrian civil society organizations were either closed down or placed under direct control of the state, while media outlets simply became tools of government propaganda. So, to conclude, um, in the early 1970s, urban Assyrian intellectuals took advantage of Lotto 51 to promote their culture and periodicals associated with their clubs, as well as in more popular cultural formats. They negotiated for political rights by deploying accepted Ba'athist ideologies of socialism and integrated themselves into state constructed narrative of Abbasidism. They placed their concerns within the context of the accepted medium of language since Lotto 51 permitted the exercise of rights within cultural and linguistic frameworks. Using language as a framework and rhetorical device, 
They approach sensitive issues such as the Semel massacre and Assyrian identity, tracing a continuous thread of cultural existence from ancient Mesopotamia through the medieval Syriac heritage to the modern period. In the early 1970s, Assyrians not only negotiated, but also resisted government policies they disagreed with, though this approach was much more prominent in popular culture and song than in more formal media. By the end of the 1970s, and especially following the Iran-Iraq war, the Baathification of society and of Assyrian institutions in urban centers was became more visible, restricting intellectuals from negotiating with or resisting the government, either in the pages of Mardana Atraya or in other cultural outlets. Of course, um, in the north and other spaces of the Iraqi opposition, which, which continues, especially with the beginning of the war, um, you know, Assyrians rejoined the opposition, formed political groups, and their activism um, continued in different formats. Uh, but that will be discussed in the book. So hopefully another discussion. Uh, but, but today I'll stop, uh, tonight I'll stop here with, uh, with the 1970s and, and the discussion on Baghdad, intellectual, bilingual intellectuals in Baghdad. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Benjamin. We ask people who have questions to write them in the chat and we will moderate them. And we already have uh, two questions from you that were written uh, during your talk. Uh, so one is from uh, George uh, Charba, uh, who is asking uh, you the following. Um, could you elaborate on the identity convention that took place within law 251 uh, from uh, minority community to Christian, from a minority community to Christian community. So um, he'd like to understand why a Syrian in uh, Iraq and in the region are not identified as a Syrian and rather as a Christian uh, minority. So that's one question. A second question was addressed by Nadia uh, Yuna, who thank you for uh, your lecture and very much appreciated your analysis of the Simla song. Uh, and she's asking in regards to your research in archival material and in popular culture, she was wondering if you came across any sort of discourse from uh, the Assyrian listening public about their engagement with music. What were people saying at the time about the music as opposed to, for example, asking people now uh, their experience and sentiments uh, with the songs that were produced in the period uh, you refer to in um, your work. So um, yeah, so these are the first two questions. Again, if you have others, please direct the questions to Tom McGuire at the chat. And um, please, others. OK, thank you. So the first question was from George, I believe, right, on the Assyrian identity. Um, I think the trans, it, it's a complicated question. Uh, why, why are the Ba'athists um, concerned about Assyrian identification with the ancient past. I've asked myself this often, you know, why could they not have included them in this narrative that they were constructing? You know, this is cultural sort of uh, fusing Mesopotamianism with the Abbasid past. Why could they not include the Assyrians? It, it's a difficult question to answer. I have not really seen direct responses from the government of, of, of giving reasons. We, we could speculate and think that, uh, or without speculation, the archives, we know that they are very concerned about um, Assyrian interactions transnationally. Uh, they're very concerned about, for instance, there's a radio program that's issued um, in Iran, in Urmia, where uh, you know it's picked up also in the north. And there are reports about that in, in Ba'athist archives and, and they want to stop it somehow and limit the Assyrians in Iraq from listening to, the, to those in Iraq, uh, in Iran. Um, they're also trying to suppress um, the circulation of magazines. Um, and, and you'll have reports on magazines being uh, published in Iran and in, in other places where they're making their way to Iran. Uh, so the transnational aspect of the community is something that's very concerning to the, to the Ba'athist. And maybe to some extent, um, they, they, they view the community as, as foreign, as, as not being native. So, so how could they be Assyrian? How could they be associated with this ancient past that the government is trying to sort of um, narrate and, and fuse in a particular um, 
in a particular way, which which includes Arabism, includes Arab nationalism, and the Assyrians are rejecting Arab nationalism. So it's, it's a bit complicated for them. Uh, but, you know, at the beginning, in the early 70s, and this was really revealing for me because I saw in these archives where um, they're referring to them as, as a national um, minority, a national minority. But then later on in the 80s, when you when you have reference to the community, they're always called a, de a denomination. So I think when the when the significance of the community is is not there within the opposition, or the com or the Ba'ath state does not need to be concerned about how it appears to Western governments, the Iran war has begun, and anything can be sort of. Um, covered under the the frame of the war, you know, while there's war going on and these groups were um, acting against us, so we had to suppress them or, you know, so then it becomes less problematic for them. Um, so so that's that's how I would answer it. I, I hope it satisfies you. Uh, and for uh, Nadia, so Nadia, you know, in the 80s already, um, a lot of these um, in Iraq in particular, and I believe that's where you're uh, uh, what you're questioning. Uh, in Iraq, uh, many of these singers, so, so I talked about um, uh, the um, uh, Shmuel, who, who the, the singer of the Semel song, who had to leave the country um, because he became harassed. Daoud Isha was also harassed, another singer. Uh, many of them, you know, um, if they if they sang songs which included Assyrian sort of um, tra links to the Assyrian past uh, or identity, uh, were asked to come in and question were questioned by the authorities. So, a lot of the singles who continued singing uh, left the country. Ashur Basargas and the Joe, many others, right? Uh, so what happens is that those singers now create their cassette tapes, their 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 producer cassette tapes uh, in the diaspora. Somehow they find their way through the porous borders, they come to Iraq. Even Agassi is another one who's who's blacklisted, right? They and, and people copy these cassette tapes from household to household. So they're illegal in many ways. So, you know, if you, I don't know if you remember an idea, but you know, the cassette, uh, the double decker cassette player where you all you needed to do was have a blank um, cassette tape. And I remember actually my, my, my parents doing this, you know, somebody will have a latest copy of Ashur Batsargas and then they would give it to them and then they would just make a copy and give it back to the person. So people made their own copies. Um, they would not talk about it in the press, not publicly, because uh, again, some of these songs, some of the singers were restricted. So you would have to be careful, especially in the 80s. So Alda, you have a question that is now directed towards you in the chat by um, Abdul Masih Bar Abraham. I hope you can see it. I don't think I do. Wait. Okay, so let me uh, read it to you. Um, did you have a chance uh, to review other publications that were produced during the 1970s in Baghdad? Um, and so that's the question. And he lists a number of publications. Yes, I, I, um, I did. Uh, actually, the article uh, Village Nostalgia that came out uh, in June of 2020 uh, looks at uh, another publication, which is uh, Qala Suryaya. Uh, so yes, I, I looked at uh, many of them. I collected many of them. Uh, Murduna Aturaya was significant. Why? Because it's um, it's one of the first ones that um, locally on the ground people were trying to to bring together. So in 2011, when I started my research, I would call different um, people who I knew had collections or some libraries and ask, do you have issues of Murduna Aturaya? And they say, and they would tell me I have one or two. And of course, that's not enough. I wanted all 10 years so I can look at every issue over a decade and see, you know, how how the narratives change and, and uh, you know, analyze them more critically and, and with nuance. Um, so but when I went to Iraq, I found these smaller publishing houses that were starting to collect some of these magazines and Murdana Aturaya was one of the first ones who um, they were they were scanning already when I was there. And one of the um, archivists shared the material with me and said, you know, when I finish scanning it, I will send you the rest. Um, and also Murdana Aturaya and the Assyrian Culture Club comes up uh, a lot in, in Ba'athist archives. So this is a club and a magazine that not only the community cares about, about uh, it's widely circulated um, 
you know, uh, has uh, in, in the editorial board, board has members and, and also the authors, the contributors are coming from different denominational backgrounds um, and educational levels. So it's a very prominent hub. It's a very important club and appears in Bathurst archive. So I, I focus a lot on it in this particular chapter, but I examine many other sources. Um, and like I said, this, this new article, if, you, if you're interested, if you, uh, you can email me and I'll be happy to share it with you. Looks at Qala Suryaya. Yeah, and uh, okay. So you have some information in the chat, but meanwhile, um, I want to read you two other questions that are written by uh, members of the audience. Uh, so our former student, uh, Atur Lawandu um, is asking what role uh, did the Cold War play in the Syrians negotiating their place um, with uh, the Ba'athist state, which itself was negotiating its place between Cold War powers. And she congratulates you on your book like many others. Um, and then we have another question from Noma Nabi, uh, who is asking about the current government's uh, uh, a treatment uh, of the uh, Assyrian identity. Okay. Um, hello, Atur. So your question is, is is a very very important one. So the the government in the early seventy beginning of the nineteen sixty eight when it comes to power in the early seventies still it's uh, considering both both sides. Does it negotiate you know lean to the west or the Soviets? You know they have a Soviet arms deal uh, already signed. Um, they they make the Communist Party uh, legal. Um, so that in that perspective you know. Um, Assyrians associated with the Communist Party uh, and you know the Iraqi opposition in general become important. Uh, at the uh, on the other hand, uh, the Baathist regime is also interested in appealing in a, appearing in a positive light to Western governments. The Assyrians, in particular, have a lot of um, have a lot of um, diasporic communities that are already um, you know increasing in number, and they are complaining to human rights reports, uh, human rights organizations. They're complaining to the Western governments. For instance, uh, right after the Algiers Agreement uh, or around that time, you know, there are villages raised um, in the 1970s uh, in Bedouar and again in the 1980s, uh, or if, if, if Syrian members are being persecuted, uh, they, Assyrians, complain to these human rights organizations. So the, the Ba'ath, especially before the beginning of the Iran-Iraq war, wants to appear in a positive light. So, so appeasing um, these groups is important to them. You know uh, about village uh, village destructions, for instance. They invite uh, the patriarch of the Church of the East to come and have conversations with them. Uh, they they come up with some kind of you know um, narrative where we uh, we. Um, relocated these citizens because they needed to be in um, their their villages were not uh, we were not able to they, they were so remote we were not able to provide services for them we put them in modern villages where they could have more services you know so they're responding in a, in a trying to present themselves in a positive light uh, at least early on in the 70s and and that has something to do with how they want to appeal um, and, and the cold war politics involved in that period so, uh, uh, oh, the second uh, question. Yeah, and the current government treatment of Assyrians uh, and identity in particular, I believe, right? Um, you know, I I think the current government does not really have any issues with how Assyrians identify in in general. Um, I've written a few articles, a few short pieces on. Uh, the Assyrians um, and the Kurdish referendum and, and uh, Assyrians post ISIS and how they should be included. Um, I think we, I think I will leave this question to uh, my, my colleagues in the political science and contemporary fields to answer this question. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, I think it's interesting. We, we, there's a lot of, um, the international sort of goal, you know, lights are on Iraq. There's there's focus and there's uh, reports on on the abuse of minorities. So of course the government wants to appear in a positive light and it wants to appear as, you know, it is um, trying to to help and um, work with them. But um, I think there are some similarities, you know. Um, from with the 1970s period, well, now they're just using sort of narratives of yes, acceptance and 
coexistence and pluralism, but how, how hard are they really trying to um, ensure that Assyrians survive in Iraq and, and how, how much are they including them and empowering them? I think, I think not so much, but, but many others can answer this question better than I, the, I can as a historian. So the two other questions are actually about history. So Neil Joseph asks, uh, uh, thank you for your great presentation. Uh, in one of your past works, Assyrian and the Iraqi Communist Party, you mentioned how the courts used claiming to be descendants of ancient Mesopotamians as incriminating evidence against uh, them, against the Assyrians. Did they uh, specifically do this because they view Assyrians as Arabs who were denying their Oruba or Arabness, or did they view them uh, as complete uh, foreigners? Um, and then I'll just give you another question about Iraq that also came from Mr. Uh, Simon Francis Shamoun, uh, who also congratulates you for uh, your uh, talk and who lived in Iraq at this era. And he's asking, what in your opinion, uh, what is your opinion on issuing law two, uh, 251 and uh, invitation of the late Mar Shamoun uh, and granted him Iraqi citizenship? So how did these two um, events have an impact on the Assyrians at the time of the 1970s uh, and the consequences that followed later? So he wants you to elaborate. So these are two historical questions. What did, I, I missed the first part of the question uh, by so um, Dr. Simon know, Shamoun. Uh, he wants to know uh, your opinion on issuing the law. Oh, issuing uh, the law, okay. The invitation of the late Marsham on and the, the citizens. Okay. So how do these two have an impact on the Assyrians in the 1970s and later? Thank you. Uh, so for the first question related to the uh, the ICP or the communists, so that actually, it's it's really interesting. I mean, this is a court um, uh, police records, you know, it's in um, uh, one of one of the um, a court case involving uh, four, uh, four men uh, who worked in, in the IPC, Iraq Petroleum Company. And um, two of them are eventually released on bail. Um, and the third serves a short sentence. The fourth, um, unfortunately, dies in prison. Uh, we don't know the causes. He, he just, you know, uh, the last page we have that I have on his file is that he, he passed away. So his case is really interesting. It's quite long and it, it drags and his wife tries to sort of um, go on and appeal on his behalf. Um, so you really see the impact of, of, um, of these trials um, on the Assyrian community in 1963 lasting up until 1966 in some cases. So uh, Apram Amma, in, I think it was, uh, no, not Apram Amma, okay. Apram, um, I forget the last name now. Uh, but basically with, with, this, with this case, um, in, in the incriminating report that's issued by the court, it says, and he used to call himself the identity, right? Um, why, why do they do that? You know, I, I, and they say that after he serves a sentence, uh, we should look into his natural, his citizenship. If he was not born in Iraq, he should be sent back to where he came from. So again, this goes back to the whole, um, you know, the, are Assyrians native to Iraq or are they foreigners? So are they thought of as this community that only came to Iraq post World War I? They do not have a space in this country that was created. And, and this is what the Arab nationalists are envisioning at the time, uh, how they're looking at the community, which is which is very problematic. And it, it comes through uh, in, in these legal trials as well. The second question uh, by Dr. Simon, um, what are my thoughts on the law? I think I think everybody was um, hesitant when it came out. Uh, there were, but but they were, you know, they viewed it positively. Of course, they did not trust the government fully, uh, but they took advantage of the law and produced wonderful uh, works in in um, you know in, in Arabic and Aramaic. Uh, they uh, in a very short period of time because already by by the mid 1970s you can say the late 1970s things had been changing and there were there were a lot of uh, restrictions placed on them but um you know these intellectuals did did wonders you know they they used every tool they had whether they could negotiate or they would re resist um but um they engaged with iraqis um who were 
poor Arabs or Turkmens or Kurds, they published in, in various different, I mean, you would see uh, one, one, um, one of these um, intellectuals, you know, where he or she is heavily sort of uh, contributing to Murdana Turaya, but at the same time, you'll see articles by them in, in other newspapers, non-Assyrian newspapers, Kurdish or, or Arabic uh, or Turkmani, and, and, and there was a sort of, um, wonderful space that was hierarchical it was hierarchical you know we cannot uh, say it was all you know um, they all existed at the same level uh, but uh, you know the language was standardized uh, there were important discussions and um, you know intellectual um, collaborations uh, happening and it brought the communities from various sort of denominations and allowed them a space to discuss internally also how, how they identified and what was important to them. And, you know, I think that period is really formative for Iraqi Assyrians. Uh, and, and you see sort of those same intellectuals and ideals, um, you know, uh, formed during that period, still having an effect in the 1990s and to some extent even um, smaller scale perhaps, but even today. So I, I thought it was, I think it's, a, it's an important uh, law that um, although with limited sort of um, with restrictions, but it still opened up an important space. And how they, um, so what I thought about the return of the patriarch, again, I think everybody thought that this, this could be something positive. You know, the patriarch of the Church of the East had been exiled with these other leaders and they were welcomed back and they thought, well, you know, this, this could be something positive. They were not completely fully, you know, on board and, and they did not fully trust the government and the patriarch eventually returned, I believe, uh, very, um, very shortly after. Uh, and I believe he was quoted as saying that, you know, he could not give empty promises to his people. Um, you know, and, and, but I think, I think they, they wanted, they wanted to see where this would take them and they wanted to negotiate uh, and, and, and have some kind of a positive impact. Okay. So we're getting a lot of questions. So uh, know that you're in line and we're just trying to uh, manage uh, a lot of them coming. So the next question is from Joe Hermes, who is actually going to uh, participate in this lecture series and is writing a PhD at the University of Chicago in the Assyrian press uh, in the United States post-World War I. So Joseph is um, asking, um, the Baptist space estate sponsored another quote-unquote cultural uh, magazine, Majmua uh, Suriyaniya, that was published in Arabic and Syriac around the same time as Al-Musaqqaf. So can you talk um, about the former uh, far less emphasized um, uh, publication um, and um, and um, and how was that um, Assyrian and was the Iraqi state institutionalizing two different kinds of quote unquote Syrian Christian um, identity, uh, an Assyrian one and a Christian one? So that's one question. Um, okay, I'll let you answer this. And, and so, can... are you referring to the Mujma al Suriania, which was, you know, I believe under the uh, the Ministry of Culture or so. So it was like a magazine associated. Is that what you're referring to? I think so. If so, if so, I mean, uh, yes, I mean, they carried some similar discussions, you know, folklore was important um, to them, language discussions, you know, the various sort of um, cultural sort of intellectual discussions that were happening. They, they happen in various different magazines, but if, if you're referring to the one that's aff affiliated with the, um, the, um, the states um, issued by the Ministry of Culture, that would have been a lot more sort of in line as opposed to the Murdanaturaya. Murdanaturaya, you saw more freedom and uh, some of these engagements pushed the boundaries more than perhaps other um, magazines. Okay, so now I'll group two questions together. So Charles, Mr. Charles Bouricha asks, who interviewed Marsha Maun uh, on his historic return to uh, Iraq at the Baghdadi observe, uh, Observer newspaper? And can you s give us some highlight uh, of some responses to His Holiness, uh, uh, of His Holiness to the question? Um, Bahaidin Pirborani asks, uh, how did the editors of the magazine uh, show other ethnic and religious groups, so Yazidis, Kurds, and Turkmens. Um, the, the magazine, uh, the magazine was only in Aramaic and Arabic. Um, and then there is a question from uh, Mr. David Malik: What caused the uh, large exodus of Assyrians from Iraq uh, to the West in the early 1970s? 
and then we'll get some more. Okay. Uh, so the Marshamon interview, I, I don't, um, you might be referring, or I refer to the um, um, Yaqo's interview in Mordana, not Marshamon. So the Marshamon, it, it, it doesn't, um, I would have to sort of look it up for you and get back to you on that. I, I don't know if there was an extensive interview with Marsha Moon, uh, but I refer to the Yako interview, so you might be confusing the two. Um, and and you know he gave he gave a really I, I have that uh, summarized in my book, the forthcoming book. He gave a really um, a strong um, interview, and as you saw from the quote that I quoted um, about. His, you know, uh, he was not happy with the use of the Natqim uh, Siriania, the speakers of the Syriac language, as a title, and and he was quite forward with with um, how he thought about um, the laws and, and such. I've also interviewed people who worked very closely with him in his negotiations with the uh, with the Iraqi state, and uh, during that time, they were they were um, hoping that he would form a militia to to counter. Um, against the, the the Kurds in the north, and he was not comfortable with something like this. So th there's uh, there's more on that. Um, I, I don't want to take things out of context of chapters I have not discussed. Um, the but thank you for the question. Very important question. Um, Mordana, how they talk about other groups. Um, you know, positively they don't come up so much. Um, but but Assyrians are in conversation with other groups. You know. Benjamin Haddad, for instance, uh, there's a, I believe it was called a Ta'akhi, a Kurdish newspaper in Arabic published in Baghdad, had a page, a Safha al Ashuriya, which Benjamin Haddad, um, who was, you know, at one point an editor, but quite important uh, contributor to Murdan Atura, he also edited um, the Safha al Ashuriya, the Assyrian page in, in Ta'akhi. Um, and, and they, uh, they, you know, there really is this dynamic space among Iraqi intellectuals in Baghdad. Um, and, you know, the, the Arabic and the, uh, the modern Aramaic or Syrian are not saying, are not speaking the same language all the time. You know, they're not translations of, of each article is not translated. There are different discussion happenings and to some extent to different audiences. You know, the Assyrian section is a bit older. There are people who are fluent in Assyrian, so they they had the chance to study it when when schools were uh, much more, you know, available to them. The Arabic are are younger, a bit more progressive, uh, and you see that issues that they discuss, for instance, when talk when it comes to gender discussion, it's much more progressive in the Arabic section by these younger uh, younger generation of Mordan al Turaya. Uh, contributors versus the older, um, you know, role of the mother, uh, the protector and the, the the preserver of the nation and such in the Aramaic language presses, but very engaging space. Um, also in, in uh, at this time, especially in the 70s, which I talk about in my article, um, uh, The Village Nostalgia, uh, the um, uh, Tariq al-Shab, uh, the communist uh, newspaper, publishes a lot and includes Assyrian writers who are writing about violations to their villages, some by the KDP, um, and, and constantly has these articles on, on various issues and relating to also the cultural rights and how important they are to them, you know, and, and, and such. Uh, and I should also mention that the Turkmen's were also given these rights. So, the, the, you know, the, the government is not only negotiating with the Assyrians, but the Turkmen's are given cultural rights. The Kurds have political and other sort of, um, uh, you know, um, um, administrative uh, rights as well granted to them and a form of an administrative region is being discussed and formed to some extent, um, not fully. And then the final question was what caused um, Orit, uh, if I can remember. Uh, the, migra the migration in the 1990s. Oh, yes, the migration. Yeah. So, you know, a few different things. You know, these, the Civil War is one in the North. Um, and, and, you know, it's becoming, it's becoming clear that the Baathists are not as, as uh, you know, you know, they're not as positive and, and, and honest with these um, policies and, and cultural rights that they've granted. Um, so, you know, people are, you know, a, lar a large number of people start immigrating. They sort of sense things going um, in a negative direction. 
uh, and and they they leave the, the country, they migrate. Um, so that's I think one of the reasons you're you're seeing cracks on um, very singers, um, uh, you know, sometimes uh, cultural clubs, um, and y y you're starting to see the bathification of society uh, more so. Um, more elements of it are becoming sort of a reality, and and people are are deciding that they're not comfortable and that they want to leave. And uh, I believe. Um, uh, you know, uh, there's also places, um, immigration laws are becoming leaner uh, in, in various different countries where they're accepting um, uh, communities from, from, you know, Middle Eastern communities and such. And there's agencies in some of these places like Lebanon, where you can go and register and eventually settle somewhere. So, so it's a variety of factor, but I think mostly some people are not um, as comfortable with, with the Ba'ath regime and, and, and they sort of lose hope and this, this positive space that they envisioned for, for their community. Okay, so we have uh, quite a few uh, more. So uh, we have a question from uh, Yvonne uh, Suresha, who is asking with reference to uh, the Assyrians who were Arabized or at least uh, who were in uh, indifferent to Arabization, how is the relationship between those who identify as Iraqi Christians or Arab Christians and those who identified as Assyrians in terms of uh, social, political, and economic life. And then Neda Baba sent us a, a very uh, complex question. We can't uh, read uh, all of it, but uh, to sum up, she's thinking further about this, uh, sort of these practices of collective memory and Syriac uh, language um, and literacy. Um, and she wants to know sort of about the differences between, if I understand it correctly, between um, identifying with Eastern Christianity on the one hand and uh, the Mesopotamian um, identity uh, on the other hand. And if there's a, a conflict within this uh, claim for uh, heritage, if this tension arises in your own research, um, and, um, and and the sort of uh, how, how uh, she's asking, I'm wondering if this tension arises for you in your research and what uh, you make of this uh, in the ways that uh, we have constructed our understanding of who we are. Um, then there's uh, another question from uh, Mr. George uh, Sheena, who's asking if there's a reason why you didn't mention the Bahara magazine. Bahara, um, Bahara yes. Then there's a question from uh, Joe Snell. Uh, who, um, is also, who is asking about the similarities and the differences between Assyrian activism in the 70s um, and uh, today. Um, and the last one is from uh, Rahim uh, Daniel, uh, who uh, wants to know um, if you happen across cultural clubs, uh, constitutions, and what they look like for the Assyrians uh, organizing at the time. And again, apologies if I misrepresented or, and I omitted a lot of compliments for you, congratulating you on your book and your talk. So just- Thank uh, you. So, just. Uh, so Arabized Assyrians versus um, non-Arabized Assyrians. And, and I think the question related to socioeconomic um, mm -hmm. background. So yeah, yeah, I mean, Arabized Assyrians tended to be more um, urbanized, had been urbanized for longer periods of time, perhaps. Uh, maybe they had lost, um, Aramaic as a as a mother tongue or spoken tongue um, in their homes for the past for a few generations, maybe two two or three, more likely two generations or so. Um, how they would have interacted with each other, I think, it depended on what spaces and how they existed with each other. You know, um, if you think about you know two communities, one is more recently urbanized. Um, more, you know, struggling. And this is especially in the 1960s, maybe in the 1970s, it, be, it becomes a little bit different. Um, clearly, there, there will be socioeconomic differences, and that would be a divider. So I think, you know, I argue that we always segregate Assyrians according to their religious institutions and denominations. But as you very um, correctly mentioned, socioeconomic would have been one of them. And, and that certainly 
relates to how people identify. You know, if you've lived in an area for a long period of time and, you know, you become Arabized, you know, you will, you might have less in common with somebody who has just recently set, settled in the same, from a village. And you would not even exist in the same spaces. You know, you would, you would, if you're socioeconomically better off, you'd be in uh, better neighborhoods in Baghdad. Uh, whereas those who are less, uh, you know, um, less on this socioeconomic scale would, would be in, in poorer neighborhoods or sort of middle um, uh, middle class neighborhoods. So so there would be differences. Um, you know, you might you might connect in, in particular churches and, and various different spaces, and you might also connect ideologically, not only within a certain nationalism, but also or a certain cultural institutions, uh, but also, you know, it could be left leaning. Uh, political activists that are, you know, a worker and, and somebody from a, a manager who might lean, um, might lean left because, you know, they find themselves uh, attracted to this ideology given its, you know, its um, promotion of socioeconomic justice and secularism, right? So, so you might find your, yourself in similar spaces because of where you lean, ideologically, where you go in, ter in terms of certain institutions like religious institutions, but, but socioeconom socioeconomically we you would be divided, uh, no doubt. Uh, and in terms of the collective memory, if I understood it correctly, Eastern Christianity on the one hand and Mesopotamians on the other, and conflict. So this this period that I look at, you know, there's a lot of discussions about who we are, uh, how do we sort of um, come together as, as um, members of these um, adhering to Syriac Christian heritage, uh, you know, uh, an umbrella of a, a couple of churches or let's say a handful of churches. Um, during this period, Mesopotamian is, is, is one of the elements that's accepted uh, along with the language, the Aramaic language the Syriac packs, uh, past, uh, the cultural traditions, these elements are coming through in, ma in many of these magazines. They are tracing to the ancient Mesopotamian heritage, maybe in certain magazines, certain culture clubs a little bit more uh, so than others. But but these four elements, the cultural, your, your, uh, you know, the Mesopotamian heritage, you being a native component of the country, your Syriac Christian past, um, your language, your spoken language, which, which um, collectively sort of uh, brings you together, uh, unites you, and, and your cultural traditions are all elements that are not so much in tension at this period that I'm discussing in the 1970s. Um, and the question relating to Bahra magazine, I do discuss it in my final chapter. So my, my book is um, covering the period from 1960. I mean, I you know, the introduction looks into the earlier um, periods, some of the formative modern periods, but but the, the gist of the or the meat of the discussion is 1960 to 1988. Uh, so so definitely uh, Bahra relating, uh, which was an underground uh, magazine that was published by the Eastern Democratic Movement in the um, in the Iraqi opposition in the north, um, which I believe began uh, its publication in 1982, if I'm not mistaken. So I do, I do cover it in my last chapter because the Eastern Democratic Movement is formed in 1979. So today I focus on the 70s um, and, um, and, and so, as such, I couldn't, I couldn't also talk about magazines from the 80s. Um, Josnell, I believe, asked a question on Similarities and differences between Assyrians in the 1970s and today. Um, that's a difficult question to answer. I have to think about it, Joe. You know, maybe. Yeah, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll think about it, and I'll, I, I will. Uh, you know, I think we're Facebook friends, so we will. I will talk. You know, we'll talk about this more, you and I. Um, the call across cultural clubs. Um, sorry, what was the last question, Orit, about calls? Oh, the. Uh, the club. So you wanted to know what uh, what happened across cultural clubs uh, constitutions um, and what that looked like uh, for Assyrians organizing at the time. Cross cultural institutions and what it looked like. Yeah, uh, for Assyrians at the time. So cross-cultural institutions between uh, Assyrians and, and other communities. So what were, I guess, what were the cultural clubs, their constitutions, um, and their connections to Assyrian organizations? I think that I understand. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it really was a very vibrant period. There was a lot of um, 
cultural clubs that existed, uh, like Mordana, Toraya, social clubs, athletic <laughs> clubs, um, many institutions. Um, it really was a very vibrant time. Many of those magazines or clubs had their own uh, publications as well, um, had you know, gatherings, uh, there was a lot of drama and, and uh, music performances. Um, the community was very active. Um, it was um, maybe one of the golden periods. I mean, I don't want to put this label, but, but many uh, from my, my parents' generation would refer to it as, as a golden period for them, the 1970s. You know, mm -hmm. Iraq was also doing pretty well uh, with an increase in its oil production, more income coming in. Okay, so two last questions. Uh, one, uh, unless somebody wants to write very quickly, one is from Fred uh, Brustam, who says, uh, you talked about the Assyrian song and its impact, mention uh, Shlimon Bechmoel, uh, more to death, in 1978, and in the span of three days, all known Assyrian singers were arrested by the security forces, and uh, three of the well known uh, were subjugated to torture in the security headquarters for about a month and were only released after signing a promise uh, not to sing the nationalist song. So, um, if you have um, some comments um, about that. And then Mo Mona uh, Malik writes, um, while they're realizing it's difficult to remain neutral politically, but with reference to the evasiveness of acknowledging our Syrian identity, isn't our indigeneity in Iraq and in the region a threat to the governing powers, a threat in terms of rights repreations? So. Um, so the first question regarding uh, the torturing of, of uh, and the harassment of singers, I completely agree uh, with that. Many, many of them have written, uh, singers have published on this. I interviewed Daud Isha and, and he also experienced this. So uh, thank you for the comment. Uh, I, I agree with you. And um, Mona, I think uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we do have scholarship on indigenous communities or, or using the indigenous sort of framework to think about, um, to think about Assyrians. Um, Mariam Giwargis does that, who, who is a post a Shirk postdoc in um, University of Manitoba. So uh, yes, I, I, I do agree with you. It, it is a threat and there is, uh, in terms of rights and reparations, that's all a consideration that's, that's being taken uh, likely at, at uh, higher government sort of um, echelons. Thank you for your comment. Okay, so... Um... I think uh, in that, um, we need uh, to close. So I'd like to uh, thank very, very much Dr. Benjamin for this uh, fascinating uh, talk. Um, I'd like to thank uh, everybody who came uh, to, this, uh, to this wonderful uh, talk. And again, many, many thanks on behalf of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies to the Assyrian Universal Alliance Foundation uh, and for enabling this talk. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Alba. Thank you so much, Urit. Pusham Shana, thank you very much, everyone who joined us today. And you can use your uh, clap hands and your reactions or the thumb up or whatever. Uh, yeah. And um, 